Good morning, folks. It's 10 o'clock. Time to start our topics class. Have a wonderful subject we're going to be talking about. That's heaven. So if you come on in, shut the doors, we'll get started here. We're going to be spending seven weeks on the subject of heaven. So it's time to get started, so let's do that. Let's look to God in prayer, and then we'll get into the Word of God. Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you in Jesus' name. Lord, we are thankful for the hope of heaven. Lord, it's more than a hope. It is a place that you have prepared for us, and we'll see you there. You said, where I am, there you may be also. And Lord, we look forward to that day when faith becomes sight and hope becomes realized. And Lord, we just thank you for the assurance of heaven. Lord, what would we do if we had to go through this life without knowing you, knowing our sins are forgiven, knowing there's a place in heaven prepared for each and every one that has put their trust in you. So bless us this morning, we pray. Open up our intellect and our understanding to grasp, because our minds are so finite. Help us to grasp what your word has to tell us about this heavenly place where, according to your promise, those that know you as Savior will spend all eternity. In. And so bless this time now, right from the get-go, we pray. All seven of these lessons help us to further our, our education, our understanding of what eternity is going to be like. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, um, if you take your Bibles, please, and turn to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is probably, at least, if not the last epistle that Paul wrote, it would be one of the last. And Paul is now older, and he's about to die. He's going, he is going to be executed by the emperor Nero, who is a real type of the Antichrist. And Paul knows that his time is limited. And he knows that it's only going to be a short time before he's up in heaven. And I want us to consider his attitude about the whole thing. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 6, he says, For I am now ready. He was ready. He says, I'm ready to be offered. And he likens himself to an offering that is placed on the altar, slaughtered and put on the altar, an offering to God, because he knows that's what's going to happen to him. He's going to be slaughtered by uh, uh, that crazed em uh, emperor Nero. And he says, I'm ready to be offered. And he says, the time of my departure, which means his death, the time of my departure is at hand. This is one of those verses in the Bible that tells us something is close. It says, at hand. Remember, Jesus ministered when he was here on earth, and, and his message was that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. It was close. It could have been right then, but by rejecting him, the Jews rejected him, and the kingdom was postponed. It is no longer at hand. It will come, but it won't come for, until Jesus returns and sets it up himself. Well, Paul says, my departure, in other words, my death is at hand. He know, knows that it is uh, real close. Verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I like that. He finished. He finished what he started. You know, a lot of times we begin things and we don't finish them. Uh, start something and then forget about it, on to the next thing. Start that, forget about it, on to something else. Paul finished the course and he says, I have kept the faith. Many have not kept the faith. There are many people out there in the world today that know the way of truth, have been raised in a gospel preaching church and have turned from it. They can't say, I have kept the faith. Paul could. I finished my course, I have kept the faith. And so what's the result? Verse 8, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He says, I'm going to get a reward for fighting a good fight, for finishing the course and keeping the faith. A crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. That day, meaning that the judgment seat of Christ. But then the rest of the verse says, and not to me only, 
This isn't just something just for me, he says, but unto all, unto all them that love his appearing. Do you love his appearing? Do you, are you anxious for his appearing? When he comes back again and he takes us out of here, Paul said, this crown of righteousness is for all of those who love his appearing. Well, as we talk about heaven, almost every professing Christian wants to go there. No, I've never heard a Christian say, I don't want to go to heaven. But isn't it strange that many people want to go to a place that they know very little about? And that's why we're going to have this class for these seven weeks, because we're going to, we'll be talking about a place that many Christians are going, they're going to go, but, but they don't know a whole lot about it. And it's going to take seven weeks to, uh, to talk about it here. And so uh, there are actually many that don't really believe that, that um, heaven is actually a, a literal place. And, you know, Paul was not fearful of dying. You can see that from the text that we just read here. And, you know, Paul, if, uh, uh, he, he was there. He, he was about to be executed. He knew it. And um, he didn't get the church to initiate a prayer chain, you know, to, uh, to spare his life or anything like that. He says, I'm ready. That's what he says there in, in, um, uh, in verse 6. He says, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. In the book of Philippians, notice verse 21 and verse 23 of chapter 1 of Philippians. In verse 21, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To die is gain. You know, that's just 180 degrees difference from what the world uh, thinks about dying. You know, we, we, the world does everything to, to keep themselves from dying. Paul says, not only am I ready, he says, but to die is gain. He didn't want a prayer chain praying for him. He says, no, I'm, I'm ready to go. And then in verse 23, he says, I am in a strait betwixt two. Having a desire to depart, which means to die, I have a desire to, de to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. It's far better. Is, do you really think that's true? It's far better to die and go to heaven and be with Christ? Paul tells us, yes, it is. It's, 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 uh, it's, much, it's much better. And so we're going to be studying this place that Paul said he was about to uh, embark on a journey into. You know, it's interesting in uh, Shedd's dogmatic theology, there are 87 pages dedicated to hell and eternal punishment. But when it comes to the study of heaven, there's only two pages. 87 pages about hell and punishment, but only two pages on heaven. It sounds to me like we need to know more about heaven than we do about hell. Jesus talked about hell and the Bible talks about hell and it's to warn those that are going there. But he also told us much about heaven. And this is what we'll be studying for these seven weeks. Now suppose that a family in some other country, Europe or someplace, doesn't matter where, Suppose this fam a number of family members from this one family are all going to go to America. And so uh, their, the relatives back home, they say to them, well, when you get there, write us and tell us what is America like. But they're all going to go to different places when they get here. And so they, they arrive here on America's shores. And so uh, the letters start going back to the old country of what America is like. And one letter might read something like this. America is a busy, heavily populated place. It's filled with tall buildings, traffic in the streets, horns blowing, and, and uh, traffic every which way, people crowded into thoroughfares and, and so forth. And that would be an accurate description of a person that arrived, let's say, in New York City or some such place. Another letter might come back home and say, oh, America is so different. It's a place of plains and prairies. It's just flat land. 
that you can see for miles and miles. Well, this would probably be somebody that arrived out in Kansas or some such place. I remember a few years ago, my wife and I took a train to Arizona. She hates flying. And so what we could have done in four hours took almost four days. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> no, it was three days. <laughs> But anyways, um, when we, we remember going through Kansas and out in those western states, the plain states, you know, uh, the scenery, you've seen, you've seen one mile, you've seen it all. I mean, it's just <laughs> flat nothing. I had a pastor friend that loved to take a train ride. He loved to go out west on the, tr on the train. And uh, uh, he told me how beautiful, and he's the one that really talked us into doing that the first time. And I said to him, I said, uh, when we got back, I said, you know what's out there? There's nothing. How, how can you call that beautiful? Well, it's just miles and miles and miles of just flat land. Well, somebody went out there. They went in that part. So that was their concept of what America was like. Another family member might have landed in some place, maybe down south or maybe out west in mountainous country. And they would write back a letter and say, well, America's filled with mountains and, and hills and so forth. It's hilly terrain, rocky terrain. And that would be correct if, if that's the part of America they visited. Somebody else might arrive out in Arizona and parts of California. They would write home and say, America's a desert. It's all sand and rock and cactus and so forth. Someone else might come to Michigan and they would write back home and say, oh, America's a beautiful place. It's a land of woods and, ri and rivers and lakes. There's lakes all over the place. You go down a road and it either dead ends at a lake or else detours around the lake and uh, the roads aren't very straight. They've got to keep going around lakes and so forth. Well, that's the way our roads are around here. Many of them, there's just lakes all over the place. So that would be their concept of America. Another family member might arrive up in Minnesota someplace and write back and say, oh, America's all snow and ice and cold. But maybe one of their uh, brothers or sisters decides that they're gonna land in Florida. They get down there and write back and say, it's a semi-tropical place, it's beautiful, the temperature's 80 degrees. So you got all these different concepts of what America is like. Now they're not contradictory. None of these are contradictory, they're all true. But each one is in a different part of America and that's what they see. Well, the same is true concerning heaven. There are all kinds of different parts of heaven, and we're going to look at, at the different parts of heaven. By the way, next week we're going to study a particular part called paradise. And uh, there's, there's many different uh, parts of heaven, and, uh, and, and we'll be looking at them week by week as, as we go by here. Now, first of all, what does the world mean by heaven? They have a really a perverted idea of what heaven is going to be like. And the sad part of this is that many Christians have been influenced by what the world thinks about heaven. And so they get some really anti-biblical views of heaven, and that's also true concerning hell. I've had, I had a Christian man in this church one time tell me that Satan is the king of hell, and he rules in hell. He's down there in hell right now, and he runs the place. I said, who told you that? And he says, isn't that in the Bible? I said, nothing like that in the Bible. Nothing like that at all. He, he got his theology from Dante's Inferno or some such thing, not from the Word of God. Well, there are Christians that I think are getting their theology from uh, maybe watch, they watched It's a Wonderful Life or, or some such thing, and uh, they get some uh, strange ideas about heaven. First of all, you ever hear the phrase, oh, it tasted heavenly? What does that mean, it tasted heavenly? I don't know anything about the Bible about anything tasting heavenly, or if it's a perfume or a flower, it has a fragrance of heaven, a heavenly fragrance. And uh, there was one toilet paper company a few years ago that used to advertise their toilet tissue as being soft as uh, clouds of heaven or some, some such thing as that, white cloud or something like that. Um, uh, I've heard people say heaven and hell is here right now. It's what you make of it, what you make of your life. They're going to get some terrible surprise when they come to the end of their life. 
because that is not one bit true. Heaven is a literal place, hell is a literal place, and planet Earth is a literal place, and there the twain shall meet. And then I've heard people say, uh, 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 talk about heaven as a place of inactivity, floating around on a harp, and, uh, on a cloud and playing a harp, and even becoming an angel. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, it's a wonderful life, you know, you, you die, you go to heaven, and, uh, and you, you, you earn your wings, you know, and when you get your wings, a bell rings, you know, <laughs> that's Hollywood concept of heaven. None of that is true. None of that is, is biblical at all. And Islam has a t terribly strange and different concept of heaven in the Muslim religion. On the next page, we took this right out of their own teaching on what heaven is like. The underlined part here. A wonderful, sensuous paradise of gardens, fruit trees, streams, <laughs> rivers of wine, and black-eyed virgins who will be awarded to every man whose good deeds outweigh his bad deeds. So that's their concept of heaven. Boy, there's going to be some big, big surprises. That's what motivates these terrorists that they want to go to this place. Well, I got news for them. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. And a bunch of uh, rivers of wine and, and black-eyed virgins at their disposal. <laughs> um, I guess Tiger Woods must not be a Muslim. Uh, he likes blue-eyed. <laughs> 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 Anyways. <laughs> so at any rate, um, that's the Islamic concept of heaven. Most people believe it's a reward, a place we go to being rewarded for doing good. Nothing could be farther from the truth. It has nothing to do with being good or not being good. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, 12, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. No, no person can get to heaven by being good. If you could, Jesus never would have had to come to earth and die on the cross for our sins he would, could have missed all that if you could get to heaven by your good works. And because you can't, because man has, uh, is totally corrupt, as it says in Romans there, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. We have to cast ourselves on the mercy of Christ who died on the cross and paid, paid the price of suffering our hell for us so that we could go to heaven to be, to be with him. So this is, this is some of the perverted... Uh, of views of heaven. Remember um, from American history, Buffalo Bill? Buffalo Bill Cody, he was quite an entertainer. Somebody asked him one day, what do you believe about heaven or do you think you're gonna go to heaven? What do you think heaven's gonna be like? And Buffalo Bill said, my idea of real joy, he boasted, is to have my cowboys dig a water hole in the middle of the arena where I'm performing and fill it with water and then I can dip my 10 gallon hat into it and let my horse drink first out of the same hat and uh, after which I bury my face in the hat and drink and when 17,000 people cheer at the top of their voices that's my idea of heaven. Well, where did that come from? Not out of the word of God. There was a man by the name of Fred Haney. He, he is an old time baseball manager. He managed in the, in the major leagues. And one day after his team won the pennant and the World Series, a reporter came to him and he said, uh, he asked him something about uh, uh, what, what new, uh, other goals do you have? And he says, well, I wanna go to heaven when I die. And the reporter says to him, why do you want to go to heaven? What do you think it'll be like? And Fred Haney says, I think it will be a place where there's a lot of horses. He says, because I love horses and I cannot imagine heaven without horses. Well, I don't read that in the Bible either, except Jesus comes back from heaven on a white horse. But um, that was his concept of heaven. Before I was saved, I was a 13 year old boy. I went over to my friend's house. We were going to play ball. We played ball, when we, when we finished playing ball, we came back and his dad had got home from work and he invited me in and his dad had just got saved and his dad sat me down and he's gonna witness to me and he says, what are you fellas doing out there? 
And I said, we were playing baseball. And he says, oh, you know what? He says, when you get to heaven, you're going to love playing baseball. He says, up in heaven, they got bats as big as telephone poles. And they got balls that are big this big. And he says, and you can swing those, that bat and hit that ball for miles and miles and miles. I said, where's he, where's he getting? I, I didn't know anything about the Bible, but I, I didn't believe that for a minute. And, uh, but eventually, he's the man that witnessed to me and, and eventually le uh, led me to Christ. So anyways, there's all kinds of ideas of what heaven is going to be, is going to be like. Now, that's what the world thinks of heaven. But Christians have some real twisted views of heaven also. Somebody once said, where Jesus is, tis heaven. I believe there's a hymn and a hymn book by that title. Where Jesus is, tis heaven. Well, that's partly true, but it's, it's not completely true. Someone said heaven is an extension of our life, only the location changes. And there again, that's partly true. Some say it's a place of inactivity. We can just rest and, and float around. And Others say it's a place of perpetual praise and worship. Others have said it's a place of complete knowledge. All of these are partial descriptions of heaven. Some have said it's, it will be, associated, be a place of association with great people who have gone on before. Great people that have gone on before. Celebrities and so forth. Um, you know, the idea, you know, like uh, all good people go to heaven and, and so forth. And um, kind of like a, a field of dreams type of uh, uh, thing where all good ball players die and they all go to heaven. If you're a good ball player, you die. You go to heaven, you know, field of dreams uh, uh, concept. Well, that's, uh, of course, we know that, that, that that's not true. And so these different views of heaven are, are out there today. But we need to focus on the word of God and what does God mean by heaven. This morning we're going to look at an overview of heaven. This is just an overview. We're going to see 16 things, 16 insights into heaven this morning. Not going to spend any time on them, won't have time to, to uh, spend a lot of time on them, but we'll be dealing with them all in, in future weeks. So every basic need that, that we have, we, we will see that need is met in heaven. We know that much about it, but we're going to see these 16 things, different concepts of heaven, just like the immigrants that came to America and write, wrote back home of what America was like. We could do the very same thing concerning heaven, because heaven is a huge place, and it's, there's different parts of it, and they're different. And so we're going to search the scriptures and study and see what heaven is actually going to be like. Well. First thing we want to note about heaven is that there is a tabernacle. Heaven has a tabernacle. In Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 2, we read, A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Which the Lord pitched and not man. There is in heaven a Tabernacle. Now, on the next page, at the top of the next page, a picture of the earthly tabernacle. See that picture of that earthly tabernacle? Let's take a quick glance at it. Moses was told to build the tabernacle after the pattern that God gave him of what he states here, the true tabernacle, which is in heaven, in Hebrews 8, 5 here. It says, uh, uh, well, we'll start reading it along here. See, saith he, that thou makest all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. God gave him a blueprint of the tabernacle in heaven. And he says to Moses, I want you to make this earthly tabernacle just like the heavenly tabernacle. So we know what this heavenly tabernacle is going to look like because Moses followed his instructions perfectly. So there is a tabernacle in heaven. Now the word tabernacle means a tent or a, or a covering. And the earthly one was simply a shadow or a type of what the heavenly tabernacle will be like. Now this is, we're into the Christmas season and in the four gospels, Matthew presents the Christmas story Luke presents a different aspect of the Christmas story. Mark never mentions the Christmas story. But in the Gospel of John, he summarizes the Christmas story, the birth of Christ coming into the world. He summarizes it in just one verse, and that's chapter 1, verse 14. 
It says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the Christmas story in a digest version. The Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Now that word, uh, dwelt there, is the Greek word shenko, which means a tabernacle. Jesus tabernacled amongst us. He is the tabernacle. That is, he, he dwelt amongst us. And the, the, um, uh, the, the tabernacle, he, he tabernacled with us. This was God's dwelling place. And because of that, we read there, we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father. So we saw, we could see, if we were there when Jesus was born and his lifetime, we could see the glory of God, the glory of heaven in the Lord, in the Lord Jesus Christ, because that's that same word. So heaven was a, is a tabernacle. Then secondly, it is also called a sanctuary. Hebrews 8, 2 says a minister of the sanctuary. So not only is heaven a tabernacle, but it's also a sanctuary. Notice in Psalm 102 verse 19, for he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary from heaven. His sanctuary from heaven. What is a sanctuary? Well, it is a, first of all, it's a place of worship. But secondly, it is a place of refuge from danger. A place of refuge from, from danger. Down here in this life, there is danger. There's murderers, there's all kinds of things going on. Rapists and killers and robbers and, and all of that down here. Uh, but we have a sanctuary. When you get to heaven, you'll be saved. No one can touch us when we get there. Now remember the tabernacle. The tabernacle was built after the specifications of the true tabernacle, which is in heaven. And in Matthew chapter 23, verse 34 and 35, he talks about the death of Zechariah. Zechariah was one of God's Old Testament prophets. He wrote the second last book of the Old Testament. And like most of the prophets, the Jews killed him. And we read here about his death. It says, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, the son of Bacchus, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar out there in the courtyard of the temple, which replaced the tabernacle. He says, out there, that's where you killed him. He had run into the temple for protection, for a sanctuary, and they violated it. They came right on in and they killed him. A few years ago, probably about eight, 10 years ago, some terrorists over in Palestine ran into the Church of the Sepulcher in Bethlehem. I don't know if you remember that or not. And they would not go in and get them out because they didn't want to destroy that ancient church that is over there. Supposedly, the, uh, the birthplace of Christ was, was right on that spot. And so they, they had respect for that church building that was there. And those terrorists, they just tore the place apart. You know, all kinds of rotten things, filth and and human feces and everything all over the place. And, and, uh, but they wouldn't go in and, and get them out lest they, uh, you know, because they were in, in a sanctuary. Well, we have a sanctuary, a place of refuge. Now, um, uh, on, on, the next, on the next page uh, of your note sheets, the page on which the tabernacle is, we have some Old Testament instances where people came into the temple or the tabernacle for a place of refuge. In 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 28, we read, Joab fled into the tabernacle of the Lord and caught hold of the horns on the altar. That was supposed to be a place of refuge. He was fleeing for his life. And in right under that, in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 50, we read about a man named Adjaniah. He caught hold of the horns on the altar. That was to, for protection. 
so they wouldn't kill him. And in 2 Chronicles 24, the 21st verse says, They conspired against him and stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. Out there in the courtyard, they violated, they violated the, um, uh, the sanctity and the sanctuary of the house of God. But we have a tabernacle in heaven and we have a sanctuary in heaven. It's a place of, of, uh, of uh, protection. Thirdly, it is a throne. There's a throne in heaven. Notice on your note sheets, Isaiah 66, 1. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. The heaven, he says, is my throne. God's throne is in heaven. Now, there are two different thrones. There is the throne of God the Father up in heaven, and there is an earthly throne of the Lord Jesus here on this earth. Now, the earthly throne... No one has sat on that throne since the last king, King Zedekiah, who was slaughtered there by King Nebuchadnezzar around 600 BC. No one has sat on that earthly throne. That's Jesus' throne. It's the throne of his father, David. And that's an earthly throne, and Jesus is going to come back and occupy that earthly throne at his second coming. That'll be the millennial kingdom. But the heavenly throne is the throne of God the Father. Jesus today is sitting on the heavenly throne next to God the Father. As the 110th Psalm says, come and sit on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. That's at the second coming. So these, um, the heavenly throne is the throne of God the Father. He says, heaven is, uh, is, uh, heaven is my throne. And notice in Matthew 5, right under that, Matthew 5:34. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. The perfect form of government is a theocracy. Theo is the Greek word for God. This is a form of government that the world has never known yet. It is where God is ruling everything. And this is what it's going to be like in the kingdom age. It's going to be a theocracy. God is going to be on his throne. Jesus is going to be on his throne. But right now, the throne is in heaven from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. All right? And this is the throne that we are asked by God, in fact, encouraged by God, to come before this throne. While we're right here on earth, we're encouraged by God to come not just come, but to come boldly before this throne. Hebrews 4.16 Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. It's a throne of grace. God's grace. God is gracious. He says, come boldly. Now, they couldn't do this in the Old Testament because Jesus hadn't died for their sins yet. So God was on his throne, but he was unreachable. They had to come to him with animal sacrifices. But Jesus died on the cross and rose again and has ascended into heaven. And he says, we'll come boldly unto the throne of grace. It's a gracious throne. And he says that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of needs. So what is heaven? Well, the Lord is, number one, in his house, the tabernacle. Number two, he's in his sanctuary. And number three, he is on his throne. So these three, the first three aspects of heaven. Fourthly, it is a temple. Now they used the tabernacle while they were in the wilderness. They had to pack it up every day and then unpack it at night and set it up again because they were on the move. So those 40 years in the wilderness, they, they had the tabernacle. And then they moved into the promised land. And when David became king, he says, I want to build the house of God. I want to replace the tabernacle with the temple. Well, the temple was, inside the temple was the same specifications as the tabernacle. The difference is it's a permanent building. It's not a tent that you keep moving every day. It's a permanent building. Well, in, the Bible tells us in heaven there is God's temple. 2 Samuel 22.7 the, uh, Samuel, uh, David is, uh, he says, In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God, and he, he did hear my voice out of his temple. 
God is in his temple. David says, he heard me. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting on a throne. There's his throne. High and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Isaiah had a vision of God in all of his celestial glory sitting there upon his throne in his temple. Well, the thing about this, the temple, as opposed to the tabernacle, is it's a permanent place. And when we get to heaven, folks, it's a permanent place. We're not going to have to pack it up and move every few days like they did with the tabernacle in the wilderness. But it's a permanent place. It's a permanent home. It is where we will be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. Never to be uprooted again. You know, we are in this life, the Bible says we're nothing but strangers and pilgrims. And many times we have to move from place to place. How many times have you moved in your life? Different homes, different jobs, different places, different states maybe. Some, in some cases even different countries. We have a permanent residence. And that's going to be uh, in, in, uh, in heaven. And it's going to be a wonderful place because it's going to be a place with no upkeep to it at all. Not going to be like the house you're living in now. Or wherever you're, you're living, apartment, whatever it is. There's, there's no upkeep to this one. You don't have to paint every few years. You don't have to repair cracks. And you don't have to do all of these things. Keep up the yard and, and all of that. It's going to be a permanent place and a wonderful place. All right, going to the next part. Uh, uh, fifthly, it's going to be a place of glory. A place of glory. It's 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That's Jesus. By the way, that's a proof text that Jesus is God. God was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. He was seen of angels. He was preached unto the Gentiles. He was believed on in the world. And then notice the last part. He was received up into glory. He's received up into glory. Heaven here is called glory. It's a glorious place. We, when we get into some of these future lessons, we're going to see what a glorious place it is. There's not going to be any slums up there in heaven, no ghettos, no depravity. It's going to be a glorious place in which we're going to spend eternity. It's a glorious place and it's a, and it's a permanent place. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 55, they stoned Stephen, and he's dying here. But it says that he was being full of the Holy Ghost. He looked up steadfastly into heaven. God gave him a vision in his dying moments here. He looked up into heaven. And what did he see? He saw the glory of God. That's what Isaiah saw. Isaiah chapter 6. He says, I, he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his glory filled the temple. He saw this glorious vision here. It wasn't a vision. Glorious um, uh, 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 picture here of the glory of God. Just, to, just for a moment here he saw this glorious picture of God up there in heaven and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. So it's going to be a glorious, glorious place. And along with that it is a beloved place. Now here's a, um, a word that we only have one time in the Bible as a reference to heaven. It's found in Ephesians 1.6. It says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. That's a name for heaven. Why is it the name for heaven? Because it's a place where we will be loved. We will be loved by God. And we will be loved by the citizens, fellow citizens of heaven. A, a, a beloved place. A place of love, both with the uh, being loved by head and by heart and uh, a place where people are going to love you. We read in 1 John 4.19, we love him, and here's the reason, because he first loved us. If God had not first loved us, we couldn't know him, let alone love him. But because he first loved us, he went to the cross and died for our sins, and he's got a beloved place reserved in heaven for us, a place where love abounds. There won't be any faith up there because all the faith will have turned to sight. And there won't be any hope up there 
because all the hopes will have been realized by that time. Now the Bible says there abideth faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. The reason love is the greatest because faith ends, hope ends, but love continues on. The love of God is place of beloved for all of his people. And then seventhly, it is a, a place. <laughs> you say, what kind of a place? A place, a actual literal place. It's a literal place. It's not some pie in the sky in the sweet by and by. It's a literal place. And not only is it a, measure, a, a literal place, but it has measurements. We're going to see in one of these lessons the measurements, the size of heaven. It's an enormous place. Enormous place. It's going to hold all the redeemed from all the ages, from the time of Adam right up until the, uh, the very last uh, person that is saved on the face of this earth. It has, it has measurements. Descriptions are given to it. Thirdly, it has a geographical location. The geographical location of heaven is given to us in the Bible. We're going to study that in a future lesson. Fourthly, it has substance. It's not fantasy. It is substance. It's described for us. It tells us what it's going to be like. So it is a place. Jesus said in John 14, 1, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then the next verse, verse 2, he says, My Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place. What did he call it? A place. He called it a place. Where is it? He says, in my Father's house. One of the songs that was sung by the musical group this morning was uh, the Father's house. That's a biblical name for, uh, for, for up in heaven there. The Father's house. We're going to be in my Father's house. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Now, modern scholars tell us that that word mansion should be rooms. And what the, the reference here is that um, it was Jewish custom that when the, um, in fact, the Amish still do this today, that the, um, uh, when the father gets to be around 50 years old or so, he, uh, they build a little room on the side of the farmhouse and the farmer and his wife, they go and they live in that little small quarters and he turns the house over to his son, the oldest son, and he runs the farm and, and so forth. And so uh, then if the, uh, when, he, when he gets old, he's ready to retire. They, they build another little room there if they're still in the same place. And um, uh, so the next generation takes over. Well, that's, that, that was a, an English custom. Uh, I'm sorry, a Hebrew custom. But in the English language, th that's what they, th these rooms is what they called mansions. I prefer to think of them as mansions. You know, we sing, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. You know, modern Bible translation says they're rooms. It can be a silly song. I've got rooms over the, over the hilltop. <laughs> We've got a mansion. It's a mansion. It's, it's, mansion is far different than a room. It, a mansion is, is a beautiful place. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, he said that 2,000 years ago. And ever since, he's been preparing a place for us last 2,000 years. And he's told us that when he's, that place is finished, he's going to come back and receive a son to himself, that where he is, there we may be also. Now, God made the whole world and the whole universe. He created everything in a six-day span. But he's been working for the last 2,000 years on a mansion for you and I. Just think what it's going to look like. We're going to be the talk of the neighborhood. Everybody, we're, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on that when we get to that, that part of it. And so it, it is a place. Eighthly, it is a city. In Hebrews eleven sixteen, now they desire a better country that is a heavenly, oh, it's a heavenly country, okay, of God, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. In John 14, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place. Well, here he says, I go to prepare a city. A city. That city is the heavenly Jerusalem. 
And in Hebrews 13, 14, we read, For here, here on earth, we have no continuing city. The cities of earth, uh, most of them don't last very long. We have some real ancient cities, some that go back a few hundred years, but most of them don't last that long. But we get to heaven, there's a continuing city that says, but we seek one to come. We seek one to come. So heaven is going to be a country and a city, the new Jerusalem, and it's going to have citizenship. The book of Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 says our conversation is in heaven. And that word conversation is an old English word that means citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're going to have a citizenship. We'll be citizens of heaven. And there's not going to be any illegal aliens up in heaven. Nobody's going to get in that do not belong there. It's going to have secure borders and an angelic border patrol. Nobody's going to be there except those that put their trust in Jesus Christ. And there will be people there from every race, every tongue, every language, every nation, and so forth. But they'll all have one thing in common. They have trusted in Jesus as their own personal Savior. They'll all be citizens of heaven. Then ninthly, it's going to be a place of light and beauty. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on this when we get there. But listen to this. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 4. He says, since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for them that wait for him. He says here, your ears have not heard or your eyes have seen. You have no concept at all of what God hath prepared for those that wait for him. No concept at all. My son that died his favorite song was that song you may have heard it, I Can Only Imagine. And really, you can only imagine. I mean, apart from what we learn from the Word of God, you can only imagine what heaven is going to be like. But it's going to be inadequate because God himself says, your eyes have not seen or your ears heard what it's going to be like. It's going to be a fabulously place of light and beauty and glory. Back in 1950, there was a group, a convention of a group that calls themselves the Futurists, World Futurists. Now that's a fancy name, but what it means simply is that people are, um, they, mostly are sci they're scientists, um, trying to predict what the future was going to be like by the year 2000. Well, the year 2000 has come and gone, and so hindsight is better than foresight, and we can look back and see how wrong they were. Those, those world futurists, they're all dead now, so uh, their words can't come back to haunt them. But back there in 1950, their view of the world in, by the year 2000 was so different from what it actually turned out to be. All that they did was take the world of 1950 and try to streamline it a little bit. And that was their concept of the world 2000. Well, they were so wrong. They completely missed some modern inventions, things that were totally unknown back in 1950. They completely missed computers. The computers were in an infant state at that time. Uh, a, a, one computer would take up a whole floor of a huge building. It would weigh tons and so forth. What it could do was very limited. They completely missed the invention of computers. They completely missed satellite television. They completely missed DVDs and VCRs and so forth. They completely missed cell phones, bless their hearts. They completely missed the invention of the computer chip. None of these things were even in their mind at all. And as, uh, as God says here, uh, I hath not seen nor ear heard. They didn't even imagine any, uh, any of the things that have been invented since then. And here God now, uh, 2700 years ago, Isaiah lived around 700 years before Christ. 2700 years ago, God says, don't try to imagine heaven. He says, I has not seen nor ear heard what he has prepared for them that wait for him. Don't even try to imagine it. 
He says, you can't imagine it. It's going to be so beautiful and so wonderful. And everyone that tries to imagine it, apart from the Word of God, has missed it completely like the futurists did 59 years ago. Then tenthly, it's a place of enlargement of knowledge. Enlargement of knowledge. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see through a glass darkly, that's this, in this life, we see through a glass darkly, darkly, but then face to face. We're going to be face to face with God. Okay? He says, now I know in part, and then uh, shall I know even as also I am known. We'll be able to understand things. Like, for instance, you'll be able to read the directions for your DVD player and understand them. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. And uh, I just bought a new car a, few, a month ago. And some of that stuff in that you know, owner's manual, um, you got to be a rocket scientist to understand some of it. And so, but it's going to be a place of expansion or enlargement of, of knowledge. And um, uh, in Genesis chapter 11, we read at the Tower of Babel, God comes down and he confounds their language. The reason is, Nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. God re deliberately retarded the knowledge of the human race at the Tower of Babel because he said nothing that they have imagined will they not be able to do. He deliberately retarded man's knowledge. And so from the Tower of Babel right up till about the start of the 20th century, Life on this planet did not change very much. Man traveled by the same, same things, you know, uh, uh, horse-driven carriages, horseback, uh, uh, sailing ships, and so forth. There, there wasn't a big, big change in, in life up till that time. But then he also says that in the last days before the return of Christ, there's going to be this great expansion of knowledge. That's in Daniel 12, 4. He says, at the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. This is one of the ways we know we're living in the last days today. The great increase of knowledge just started around the turn of the 20th century. And as we got deeper into the 20th century, it just began like a snowball going down the hill. And now we're in nine years into the 21st century, and this increase of knowledge, I mean, it's just... It, uh, just expanding terribly. So why did God stop man's knowledge? And then all of a sudden, it's like he, he removed the hindrance there and, and knowledge is being increased. Well, um, it's because we're living in the end time. And he said, in the end time, that will happen. But when we get to heaven, all of that veil will have been taken away and we're going to have an enlargement of knowledge, things that we could not begin to understand. Well, for just an example, have you ever looked at a Hebrew text the Hebrew text, you know, first of all, they don't even read it right. They read from right to left instead of left to right. And they got all these little characters that are supposed to be letters. And uh, then they got little dots and squiggles and so forth that if you put it, a couple of those over one of these letters, then it means something completely different. I mean, who could understand that beside the Hebrews? Well, we get to heaven, we're going to speak and write Hebrew. I said, I can't do that. Yes, you can, because there's going to be a great increase in knowledge. Then, number 11, it's going to be a place of rest. Revelation 14, 13 says, Blessed are the dead that die in the Lord. And it goes on and says that they may rest from their labors. This will be in heaven. On earth, it's better to wear out than to rust out. But we get to heaven... We're going to have a place of rest. Twelfthly, there'll be a place of service. This almost seems like a contradiction. Revelation 7.15, Therefore are they before the throne of God, it's up in heaven, and serve. They serve? We're going to serve in heaven? Yeah. We're going to serve him day and night in his temple. Wow. So where's the rest? Well, God's going to work it out some way. And he that sitteth on the throne, that's the heavenly throne, shall dwell among them. You know, I was thinking about that. Do you enjoy serving God now? Do you enjoy serving God? 
Well, if you don't enjoy serving God here, I can't see how you're going to enjoy serving God up there. <laughs> so you ought to get busy serving God here if you're not, so that you can have a lot of practice when you get up there. Because it's going to be a place of service. Number 13, it's going to be a place of joy. In Revelation 21.4, it says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. These are the things that rob us of joy. Uh, tears, death, sorrow, crying, and pain. Not going to be any of that in heaven. 1 Peter 1.8 says, We rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Psalm 16.11 said, The pleasures of uh, the fullness of joy are at thy right hand, and pleasures forevermore. Luke chapter 15 tells us that there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. So uh, it's going to be a place of joy. It's going to be a happy place. We're not going to be miserable there. It's going to be a happy place. But there's not going to be any bars up there. If that's where a place where you get your joy from, sorry, no bars up there. None of the casinos are going to be up there. Not going to be any prostitutes or any of that stuff, the vice of this world. None of that's going to be up there. But the things that bring true joy, that's, that's what will, will be there. Number 14 is going to be a place of permanence. Hebrews 13, 14 says, Here we have no con continuing city, uh, but we seek one to come. That's the security of heaven. And that security starts here on earth. We call it eternal security. You accept Christ as your Savior, and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, you're secure for eternity. Even though you're still in this life, we're secure for eternity. And then number 15, it's a place of reunion. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. He says, but then I shall know even as also as I am known. I've got some ancestors I want to look up when I get there. Been dead for a couple hundred years. I'd like to look them up. I've read about them. And... Uh, I've got some others that I don't know a whole lot about. I'm not, it, 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 we will be known even as, as we are known. In Matthew chapter 17, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration, and Moses and Elijah appear unto them. And that's an that's interesting thing. Moses and Elijah appear unto them. Well, Moses lived around 1500 B.C., and Elijah lived around 900 B.C., that's 600 years apart, but they knew each other. They knew each other, and Peter, James, and John recognized them. They lived around 33 AD. How could they recognize them? Well, I don't know, but they did. There's going to be recognition of their amongst um, uh, people in heaven. And um, uh, if you notice uh, in uh, going to the next page there, in uh, Luke chapter 13 and verse 28, it says, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye, and this is talking about people that are lost, when they shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. Now that, that's an interesting statement because from Abraham to Malachi was 1,500 years. It says they're going to see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets. That takes you right through the Old Testament, Malachi being the last prophet. People in hell are going to recognize them. How, how are they going to know? They, they, they've been dead for, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. How are they going to recognize them? Well, we will know them, whether we're in heaven or hell. There's going to be some sort of recognition. We have to leave that up to God. He's going to do it. And then in Luke 16, 23, here's the rich man. He it says, in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and he seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Abraham lived in 1900 B.C., and Lazarus died in around 30 B.C. But yet, Abraham and Lazarus, they lived 1900 years apart, and this rich man in hell, he recognized both. So in hell and in heaven, we're going to recognize people. I don't know how God's going to do it. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither entered in the heart of man the things that he hath prepared for them that love him. So um, how he does it, that's up to God. And then finally, number 16, it's a place where Jesus is. A place where Jesus is. John 14, 3, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself, 
that where I am, there you may be also. I'm going to spend eternity with him. In uh, Revelation 5, 6, he says, I saw a lamb as it had been slain. In Luke 23, 43, Jesus says to the thief on the cross, today, not tomorrow or not a hundred years from now, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And next week, we're going to study paradise. Let's pray together. Dismiss us now, Heavenly Father, with thy blessing. And may this study of heaven be a blessing and anticipation for all of us that know you as Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.